Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. Uh, we welcome Charlie Kaufman and Jane Smiley to our series. They will talk about The Writing Life and Charlie's debut novel, Ant Kind. Charlie is a screenwriter of many films, such as Anomalisa, Sinect Key, New York, Adaptation, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and Being John Malkovich. He won an Academy Award for his work on Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and has been nominated three additional times. Kaufman is also a three-time BAFTA winner for screenwriting, and he has been nominated for three Golden Globes Awards, among many other honors. Jane Smiley returns to our stage. Um, she's the author of numerous novels, including A Thousand Acres, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, and most recently, The Last Hundred Years Trilogy, Some Luck, Early Warning, and Golden Age. Her next novel is Perestroika in Paris and comes out in December 2020. She is also the author of several works of nonfiction and books for young adults. A member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, she has also received the Penn Center USA Lifetime Achievement Award for Literature. Welcome to both of you. I'll let uh, Jane take it from here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Charlie. Nice to meet you. Jane, nice to meet you. I've been looking forward to meeting you ever since, ever since I was inside John Malkovich. Which oh, really? wasn't my favorite person to be inside of, but I appreciated his point of view. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you have anything? Uh, I think maybe a good thing to do would be uh, to for you to tell us a little bit about what is what the premise of your novel is and. Um, how it progresses and what you are hoping to do with it. What I'm hoping to what I'm hoping to achieve with it is that what you mean by no, doing what it? you were hoping it to come out. Do you understand what I mean? Um, I, I don't. I don't mean. Do you want to be on a bestseller list or do you? No, want I to sell like What I was hoping it would accomplish as a book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I mean, okay. So I'll I'll start trying to describe the book. It's um. It follows this guy, it's in the first person, who is a, um, a film critic, and he comes upon um, an outsider filmmaker who has apparently made a movie that's three months long, and um, it been working on it for 90 years. He's a very old man. And he um, agrees to watch it, and it's a masterpiece. In his, in his eyes, it's a masterpiece, and he, he's kind of a, like a, a third-rate, critic and he thinks that this is going to be the his ticket to um to the big time to, to usher in this this amazing filmmaker um but the filmmaker dies no one else has seen the movie um and um um it burns up as he's carting it back to new york in a giant truck so uh the rest of the book is him uh trying to remember the film so he can write about it anyway he's for various reasons he can't remember it um, and it, I, I don't know, it kind of like spins out into, um, <laughs> I don't know what it's, it's a, it's a very, um, surreal multiple kind of Multiple worlds, thing. I would say. Yeah, multiple worlds. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I was asked to write a book. Um, I thought it was a good thing for me to try to do. I was in a place in my career where I was having difficulty getting stuff made and I thought, hmm. um, you know, this would be something that I could do where there wouldn't be any um, kind of like um, restrictions on what I wrote and there wouldn't be any budgetary limitations. And um, so I worked on it intermittently for... Um, when was that? When, when was, was that? The, the contract was, um, was from 2012. So oh, really? I've been working on it for a while, but I, you know, I've had to take jobs um, and, and go away, move away from it. I was, I've been stuck as I almost always am um knowing where to go with it and um so what was i trying to accomplish i don't know i mean i think i i, I mean i i think i had i had different goals at different times in mm -hmm. the process of writing it when i settled on the idea that i wanted it to be funny uh, my goal was to make it funny um in in a real way uh -huh. um, i wasn't sure at first that's what i was trying to do or, or wanted to do um, so there were sort of many false starts along the way. Hmm. So um, 
do you feel like you were influenced by any any other novels in particular that you liked or that sort of gave you hints about what to do or did you feel like it was totally um kind of new and well i never knew i still don't know you know i mean i i kind of just sort of like do what i do by the seat of my pants mm -hmm. i didn't set out to um imitate anybody and i wasn't using anybody as a frame of reference uh but of course i've read things in my life and there's stuff in my head that i'm certain is you know influences my choices but, but are there any novels that you really love i mean yeah there are novels that i love but i wouldn't say that there are comic novels that i love and that was sort oh, of really one, hmm. yeah i i'm i'm i've had a difficult time you know i i get recommendations to read this this or that book that's supposed to be really funny and they just they aren't funny the way i wanted this to be funny um which well, is my that, experience that's the that's the 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 dilemma of the comic novel is that the person you're making laugh is you and well, that, that's the dilemma of any any work right i mean i'm, I'm always using myself as a gauge <laughs> well, it's all I have. I'm not really ever trying to do anything but that. I figure that there might be some like-minded people out there. But my goal is, do I think, in this case, or in anything I do, is do I think this is funny? Do I think this is moving? Um, is it affecting? Uh, is it horrifying? Whatever it is yeah. that I'm exploring there, I, 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 that's my goal. But it's always about me. <laughs> is that weird? Is that? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I also wonder if, you uh, felt it was dangerous to make fun of a film critic. Yeah, but that's the other thing I always sort of want to do is I want to put myself in danger. Um, I want wow. to do something that that feels risky that I don't know how to do um, and then do it. I don't know what the point is otherwise, you know? Okay. So, so that, that's part of the thing that I, I, I go for. Yeah, but you know. It's fine. I mean, I, I, I have, you know, as everybody who does what we do, we have relationships with critics and they're very one-sided. You know, we don't get to talk back to them. Um, and this was an opportunity to kind of have some fun with that. Sure. And I think that maybe that was the impetus but I, I feel like over time it expanded into something which really wasn't about in my mind a film critic or film criticism right. it's just a place to put it so when when you first started out um in the movie it, well when you first started out on your own did you always want to be a, a movie writer or director or was there something was there other, anything else that you wished you could have been or? I think when I, well, I know when I, when I was young um, and I mean, very young, uh, I wanted to be an actor. I oh. sort of stumbled upon, I was a really shy kid and I stumbled upon this thing, which allowed me to get attention and allowed me to be funny. And I, you know, the first time I was on stage and, and wasn't terrified and got laughs, which was third grade, um, <laughs> it, it was like um, it was like the world opened up to me, and and then and then I and that was what I did and wanted to do professionally since that age, till I went to um, college, and I, I actually was an, a, a theater major, an acting major for a year, and then I somehow got very embarrassed about it, and mm -hmm. and, and 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 I'd become increasingly self conscious. And I just couldn't do it, and so I transferred. I and, and and because of my interest in acting, I had interests in filmmaking. I made mm -hmm. I made films as a child. I, um, I did. Hmm. Yeah, I, I I you know I had a Super 8 camera. I made a lot of films with my friends, and so I got into film school and figured I'd be on that side of the camera and had the idea that I would, you know, write and direct things, and um, you know, and that took a long time to to come to fruition but it eventually happened isn't that always true i as far as i know that's that's hollywood you know it takes a long time to actually get anywhere the, this the surprising weird and maybe not weird thing in my case is that i 
once I actually went to Hollywood, I, I, would, I couldn't bring myself to move to Los Angeles, which, which, which is an impediment, you know, <laughs> to, to success in that business. I was yeah. really, I was terrified of Los Angeles. And, um, and I sort of, and, and I was, again, I was sort of like a shy person. I didn't know how to, um, to show anybody my stuff. I would send things. I worked in, I worked in various offices where like there were Rolodexes with famous people's mm -hmm addresses and I would send screenplays to them um, and got never got a response with one exception I, I heard from Alan Arkin which was a really lovely note wow um, that's cool but yeah but eventually um, I decided that I needed to go to Los Angeles and I, I moved there to try to get work when I was uh, in my early 30s and once I got there I got a job in TV and pretty much worked, worked consistently since then hmm. so I mean, it, and it was luck. I mean, it wasn't like I got to Hollywood and, and it just like, you know, things fell into place in a way that yeah. was very, very fortunate for me. I think that's my experience in the literary world too, because I, I went to school with a young woman who then became an editor. And uh -huh. so when I had a book, I gave it to her and, and she said, oh, I really like it. Yeah. And the best piece of luck was, that her her boss who was the real editor was getting psychotherapy five days a week so he told her she could buy what she wanted oh that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> wow up to a point yeah i mean i think that's so the, it's always the, luck there's always a piece of luck involved was that in a writing program that you knew her yeah at iowa yeah i think that that's maybe the I'm not much on those programs for not not Iowa. I, I tried to get into Iowa once and I didn't get in, but I'm not oh, much on like I'm sorry. Art, art that's okay. Art programs. You know, like I but I feel like that's the value. Um is the it's the ability to network, you know, to have mm -hmm. connections and, and stuff. Yeah, I, actually my my first agent, which is the reason I got my first job in television, was um was the agent of a friend of mine. And um so he agreed to read um, a script that I wrote, which he, he didn't read for a year and a half, but he did eventually read it. And that was, so it was a similar situation. I think. So how did you support yourself um, for those years before you actually got going in Hollywood? Um, I answered a lot of phones. I, I worked in a warehouse. I, um, I worked in a bakery. Um, oh, you did? Yeah. How was that? I always thought that might be fascinating. It was an odd, it was an odd thing. I mean, it, um, it was, uh, it was a Christian bakery and, um, which was odd. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but it was a Christian. I don't either. <laughs> yeah, it was in Wisconsin. It was called Living Bread. And, um, huh. and then like, I basically was packaging stuff. It was a little bakery and I was putting like crackers and packages. And then, um, one day they decided to give me a chance baking, but they'd never trained me. And it was a weekend. So I was there alone baking oh, wow. date, date crackers. And, um, and the problem with date crackers apparently is that they don't go the, through the machine easily because there are dates in them. So oh, the whole thing was getting jammed. It was like an episode of I Love Lucy. <laughs> it was, and I, and I eventually, I mean, that was like my last day there. They didn't fire me, but I, it was just a weird place. I didn't want to be there anymore, but I did, I did work there. And where was it in Wisconsin? In Madison. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, for a long time, I had a house way up North in the, in the lake area. Oh, beautiful. And I really loved Wisconsin and I loved the lakes yeah. and, and uh, I thought, I thought Wisconsin was really beautiful. It's beautiful. And I, um, I moved, um, to Minneapolis after that. And oh. uh, my wife and I spent a lot of time up north there in the Boundary Waters area mm -hmm. and camping up there. And that is just gorgeous. Yeah, I miss that. Yeah, it, it's, there are parts of the Midwest that they don't get credit for. <laughs> no, I think people are unfair to the Midwest. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Minneapolis and Madison are very, very, um, liberal educated towns you know oh wow yeah. when we were in um 
when we lived in Ames, we would go to Minneapolis. That would be our, our go-to place for um, any kind of sophistication. Yeah, I mean, great museums, great yeah. theater. You know, it's just a really nice place. And I like the winters. So it was exciting for me. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So let's talk about Ant Kind. Um, okay. I want to say uh, that I, I was really impressed by the language and I, 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 I probably popped out a laugh every couple of pages, along with plenty of smiles, of course. I, that's what kept me going in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, it's a little difficult to understand what's going on, but um, it, the language, that's, I think that's the unusual thing about it is that the language is easy to follow while the plot is not as easy to follow. Yeah. But I was really impressed by your precision um, oh, wow. in the way that you use the language, the way that you change words um, so that they would mean something funny. Um, and I was really impressed by the fact that you, you brought Jesus and God into the book on exactly page 666. So did you intend to do that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's a coincidence. I didn't know what page 60, 666 would be. Oh, okay. No, no. Um, in fact, I don't think I knew that until you just said it. Oh, well, now you know. Oh, I must be, it must be good. Me, but you know, it's an omen. It's an omen. It's the omen, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, let's see. What else did I put? One of the things I, I thought was really funny was way, the way that the, um, the narrator totally denigrates Charlie Kaufman's movies. Yeah. Um, and so I was wondering if you're in sympathy with the narrator about that. And if you would like to go back and redo some of your movies so that you would, you know, appreciate them more. Uh, no, I mean, there are things I would change, I guess, if I would go back, but I'm, I'm not interested in going back to anything. I, I mean, I think that the narrator, um, I wanted to have the, I wanted to have that sort of like um, sense of stepping outside of the book, um, giving him some sort of, um, giving him something to explain why he's being put through the paces that he's being put through. Oh. Um, so I think that's what I was sort of hoping for there. Um, because his, well, I don't want to give too much away about the book, but there is a kind of a, a relationship between his feelings about me and what happens, what he, what he's <laughs> put in the book. And it's just, it just sort of like, because I, I do think that that's kind of, that's the dynamic between critic and, I don't want to say artist because I don't think of myself that way, but, but, but you know, the person who does the creative work and the person who critiques it, there's a, there's a dynamic between them and there's a push and a pull and there's, animosity sometimes or or fawning or jealousy or whatever's going on and i wanted i wanted that to be in place in uh -huh. piece. so do you of your movies do you have a favorite one that you really enjoyed for whatever reason um not not really i mean i i pretty you know i've got affection for m most most of them i i like um the, the movie that I, the first movie that I directed, which was Synecdoche, New York, and then I, I co-directed a movie called Anomalisa, and now I've directed a third movie, um, which, mm -hmm. which is not yet out. And um, I, I, I don't feel more affection for them, but I feel more attachment for them because I directed them. Mm -hmm. and because um, I, I feel like it's more, um, it's more exclusively my vision, you know, yeah. for better or worse. I don't think it necessarily makes them better. And I, I know a lot of people feel like I shouldn't be directing and I should let, you know, Spike Jones or Michelle Gondry direct my movies or somebody else because I, I don't have any 
a talent for it, but um, <laughs> I, I don't really care about that. I mean, I'd like people to think I had talent for it, but I don't, I'm doing it because I want to do it, not because, you know, because I, I think it makes it better that I do it. I think it makes it mine. And I like that. Well, did, what, were there particular pleasures about directing that you enjoyed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think because, you know, what we spoke about a few minutes ago, I'm, I'm interested in acting and performance and I really like working with actors and I really like, um, you know, having that kind of relationship. And, uh, um, and, and there's something about working in production that's very different than writing, which is that it's a very social experience mm -hmm. there's lots of people around you have to be around them um which is something it's good for me to be forced to do that because i tend to sort of shy away from social stuff mm -hmm. and um and there's an excitement to it and it's also like um i can stretch and delay my writing for as long as possible but when i'm shooting a movie i have x number of days and if i don't get what i need too bad, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I know that this movie is gonna be shot. Like the last movie I did, I know it's gonna be shot in 24 days. Whatever I've got at the end of 24 days is it. Mm -hmm. um, and that in a way is, is helpful, you know? Cause oh, I, don't really? write, I don't write that way. You okay, know? so um, yeah. what, how did you find uh, to explain to me a little more about how it's helpful to have those kind of boundaries um, in your creativity. I think that's an interesting idea. Well, I, mean, I, I mean, I didn't write this book. The book is coming out now and there's various reasons that it's coming out um, now. Mm -hmm. um, but I started writing it in, in 2012 mm -hmm. and I put at least five and a half years into it. I could have put another five years into it. But, really? Well, I wouldn't want to, but I mean, that's the problem with writing for me is that I, if, I, if I don't feel like I have um, what I want it, in a particular place in a passage, I, I'll just work on it for months. Uh -huh. and I can't do that in a movie. And, that, and having that sort of, having that um, restriction on, on my ability to do that is helpful because because I, I get things done. So you don't get to be a perfectionist if you've only got 24 days. Yeah, and there's an, there's an energy that comes with that, you know, too. There's an energy on the set because everybody knows that this is what you have to do today. Yeah. You know, you have a location for a day and you have to be somewhere else tomorrow. You have to get it done that day. However yeah. long it takes in that day, that, that's what's going to happen. And then, and then what you have at the end of the day is what you have to work with. In, in editing. So um, I know that directors not, aren't necessarily the film editors, but what kind of uh, sort of control did you have over the film editing process? Directors, I mean, you know, more or less have control over the editing process. Okay. You, work, you work with an editor, an editor is the person you collaborate with. They're also the person with the sort of technical know-how to, to operate the equipment. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and the aesthetic know-how to know, you know, but you're, but I mean, I'm in the editing room every day with the editor. Okay. Um, then, you know, you turn in um, a cut, um, which is called the director's cut to mm -hmm. the studio and they give you their notes and depending on your contract or your relationship with them, they'll insist on things or they'll suggest things and, um, and then it either changes or doesn't because of that. Um, so, so I, I mean, in like the movies I've done, I've had, I've had control. So of the, the, every day of those 24 days is a very long day. Oh, it's miserable. And we, and, and, and yeah, in, in fact, we originally had a 30 day schedule, but because of, of budgetary reasons, it kept getting cut down to eventually wow. the 24 days. So it wasn't more, it wasn't that they were full. It was that they were way too full. And so it was a bit of a frantic, experience and and stressful and they always usually are unless you have you know hundreds of millions of dollars i would imagine i've never been on a set like that but i imagine that makes it somewhat simpler uh, but yeah i mean but yeah it was frantic so 
essentially, I think what you're saying is that um, when you came to write this book, you had a real sense of freedom. I did. I had, a, I had a sense of freedom. There's no, like with movies, you're dealing with, you know, even if they let you do what you want to do um, within the constraints of, of, you know, the move, the form, there's still constraints. They're still, mm -hmm. you know, they're still not going to let you, this book could not be a movie for, for right. a million, for a million reasons. <laughs> um, in, in a perfect world, I mean, or in a different world, I wouldn't say perfect, it could be a movie, but you know, the movies have to be this long. Um, you know, they, they have to attract a certain number of people, you know, I mean, you've got to, cause they cost money. So sure. even, even a low budget movie, like the one I just made, it's, you know, they want, they, they don't want to lose money on it. So they're, right. They're looking for some, you know, they're looking to cast a somewhat wider net. Um, a book doesn't cost, I mean, it costs what it costs to print it and right. whatever the advance is, but you know, it's, it's minimal compared to what a movie costs. Mm -hmm. And it does, I, my experience of books is that it does, you, you get an idea and then the idea begins opening up and it begins opening up and it begins opening up and sometimes you feel like, uh-oh, I have to restrict this idea. But other times you think, wow, I'm really enjoying how it's opening up. And then the editor says, oh my God, it's way too, but you know. It yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm more in the, in the latter camp. I, I, I like the opening up. I like the sort of, mm -hmm. the idea that things sort of spin into um, kind of chaos. I mean, to me, that's really <laughs> interesting. Um, How did your editor respond to the first draft? Did she, was, I assume uh, it was a, a woman. Did she like it? Why do you assume it was a woman? Just that most know. editors are actually. Well, it wasn't actually. It's a, it's a guy. His name is Ben oh. Greenberg. Um, oh, cool. And uh, I mean, he liked it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it, I think it was considerably longer. Um, and, you know, that was his. That was his it was considerably um, longer? Yeah, I think it. Uh, people in the audience should understand that it's seven hundred and five pages long. Yes, they should understand that. Um, so when you say considerably longer, you're talking, you know, I would guess thirteen hundred pages, something like that. I don't really remember, but I'm guessing about nine hundred pages. Oh, really? And okay. They wanted me to cut it down to five hundred pages, and I got down to this length, and it's really what I felt I could cut it down to, um, and it was. You know, I mean, what he told me at the time anyway was that he really liked it, but it was more difficult to sell a book that long. And so they wanted to make it more, uh, you know, appealing or less uh, intimidating sure. or something. So, um, but I felt like this is what I could cut it down to without starting to really compromise what it was I felt I liked in it. So I turned it back in and he read it again and he felt, I think, um, okay with it this time. And I think part of it was because he had read it twice. And uh -huh. he started, I started to understand things in the book. Um, because as you said, it's complicated and there's a lot going yeah. on. I started to see connections and things. And he felt comfortable with the length at that point. So, you know, that was, that was the end of that. That's where we well, left That's it. great. Yeah. I mean, I have to admit <clears throat> that when, <clears throat> excuse me, when uh, Ted sent me the book, I did look up on Wikipedia what the longest books are. Yeah. And, um, you were up there. Was I? Well, not you personally, but 704 were, four pages was up there. Oh, okay. Wow. When I was writing the trilogy, which would have probably been about 1,000 or 1,100 pages. I knew it was going to be a trilogy because I knew it would be too long to be a book. But I remember thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do. The first and second volumes are going to end in the middle of a sentence. Uh -huh. so, that, <laughs> so that actually it'll be a single book. But yeah. my editor said, no, no, no. Oh, I love that idea. I wish that they'd let you do that. Um, well, I think they think they would think that probably... Okay something right they would be blamed if the uh yeah readers well, didn't get to the end of the last sentence what was the what was the time between the release of those three books uh a year 
Okay. No, that's wrong. I take that back. Um, six months because I really wanted it to come out more quickly. Yeah. So the first one came out in the uh, in the fall of fourteen, I think, and then the second one in the spring of fifteen, and then the third one in the fall of fifteen. And I don't know that that was a good marketing idea. Yeah. But I really wanted to get it out and see how it worked, and and my publisher. Um, Sonny made it. He was he was willing to try that. Right. And so yeah, it was he was very open to trying things out. And so you ne you never considered just writing one book at eleven hundred pages that you just felt like would be too well. Old. You know, I'm too old to pick up an eleven hundred page hardback book, and I figure most of my readers are too old. <laughs> <laughs> you mean li literally, physically, or yeah. Or <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, I, I love the idea. Uh, I love long books, actually. One of my favorite writers is Anthony Trollope, and he did plenty of long books, you know. And then if it wasn't long enough, he'd make it into a series. So, um, so I really love long books, and I, I quite enjoyed this one. It's hard to be long and funny, though. It's really hard to be long and funny. Yeah. So did you write the whole thing at once and then split it up, or did you write it? um publish the first volume and then and then i wrote it pretty much st steadily so you know where you knew by the by the time the first one was released you knew where it was going yeah, yeah. it didn't it, it ends in 2020 um i tried to think of the worst possible things that could happen between I bet you were wrong like, i was wrong i, I <laughs> i'm a much more optimistic than i even thought i was and I have to say still? that there, I do admire um, your, uh, what's the word, imitation of the trunks. Uh-huh. I admire that. That made me laugh a lot. Oh, oh good. Yeah, that you was fun. Have, for me. You must have a very good ear. Um, well, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just, it was, that was one, of, that was actually one of the things that my editor talked about. He wasn't sure it should be in there. Uh-huh. Um, because he felt like it would necessarily date the book because we didn't know when the book came out. All books are dated. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like Trump was in the process when, when I first turned it in, Trump was about to be impeached. And so oh, okay. know, the fact that Trump was still president when this book, well into the future. Um, but, I, I, but I did the multiple worlds thing. I sort of stuck that in so it's yeah. sort of, it can be explained. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, it wasn't an issue. Are you willing to talk a little bit about the title? Um, I, I'm happy to. I'm not sure I have much to say about it. it you know. Um, well, are, are you talking first, about, when you say ant kind, are you talking about film critics in general or just this guy? Oh, no, I'm talking about <laughs> ant kind. There's a, um, literally ant, like ant, ants as a, as, as, um, as a society. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, as opposed to mankind or humankind. Um, you know, there's a, there's a character who um, is an ant who appears very late in the book and he, um, he's clearly a human and everything he says and thinks is human, um, but he's an ant. And at one point, and he keeps making mistakes that sort of tip it a little bit. And like one point he refers to mankind um, and then corrects himself and says ant kind. And that made me laugh. <laughs> so I, I just, it was one of several choices for a title. And, you know, I, I had it and I polled a few people and they liked it. And so that's So why. can you tell me what one of the other possibilities was? Oh, gosh. Stuff, when stuff, when I don't use stuff, it goes out of my head. So oh, okay. uh, I, I can, yeah, I wish I, if I had, if I wasn't on the spot, I could think of it. But right now I, I, I would be wasting our our precious time here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, early on, then when I started thinking of titles, and I generally don't think of titles um, till, oh wait, till the end. Um, uh, sorry, I just went off thinking about oh, okay. I don't think of titles till the end, and that, and that came up at the end, and I liked it, so. It's like when you like when you're naming a child, you know. Um, 
and you start out at the, the beginning of the pregnancy and you have all of these names that you love, but you get start getting tired of them. And so the names that you come to towards the end of, of the pregnancy are the ones that you tend to sort of, I don't know if that's your, I don't know if you have children, but, um, I but have, yeah. Yeah, but that was my experience um, uh, uh, and with my with with our kid. So, um, so I feel like that's kind of. Uh, it's so as you were as you were writing it, did you show it to anybody, um, sort of day by day, or did you just keep on going? No. No, I sh I don't show things to people. Okay. Um, I feel like either way, if they love it, it sort of dilutes my enthusiasm uh -huh. for some reason. Or if they don't love it, I mean, it kills it. So hmm. I never do. What happened was um, I worked on it for years and then, um, and I was struggling at one point and I uh, applied to McDowell and I got in and I went there and I worked there and I had a very good experience, you know, both like work-wise and socially. Uh -huh. And on my last night there, and then, you know, I, you know, they have this thing that people read stuff at night to, other people there or they take them on studio tours or whatever and I really thought I wasn't going to read but um I was it was my last night there and I sort of said maybe maybe not and I was kind of pushed to read and so I read uh like 15 pages of the book and um it, people were laughing and um that was my first time I I I'd read it to anybody and I really oh. I really didn't know if uh -huh. that was going to happen um, and I was really worried because I thought it would just kill it for me, but um, <laughs> if they didn't, but they did. And um, so that's the, that was the first time well into the book that I showed any of it to anybody. And it was, it turned out to be helpful for me to help me finish it. Yeah. I mean, that's my experience because when I'm working on a book, I read what I wrote the day before to my husband every morning. Yeah. Sometimes it's to see if I can get a laugh and sometimes it's to see if there's something that he doesn't understand. And when I look at the books I wrote before um, I started reading them aloud, I see more typos. I see more oh, uh -huh. raw, bad repetition, you know, things that I didn't, my eye didn't notice, but that my ear catches. So yeah. Yeah. So you, you read the whole book out loud in pieces. Essentially. Yeah. That That's fascinating to me. I, I think you're absolutely right. I agree with that. I don't do it. Um, but I, I have noticed that when I do do it, I see things. I, I feel things that, mm. that I didn't see on the page. I will start doing that. Although I, I won't do it if I write another 700 page book. Because, <laughs> yeah. But I won't write another 700 page book. The next one, if I do it, is going to be much shorter. Copy editing a book this long is- Oh my, oh, but, that must have been a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Um, it's a nightmare. And, and, and for that reason alone, I won't do it again. And sometimes copy editors are very picky. So if you thought something was funny, the copy editor doesn't even understand what you're getting at and, yeah. you know, circles it 10 times to try and get you to change it. Oh, I one time had a, I, t I one time had a copy editor that I told the publisher they had to get rid of because they were just, it was like they had OCD or something like this. Yeah. Like well, was, I guess they're not reading it for content. They're just no. looking and 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 th this woman who who copy edited uh, this book was so meticulous, and this book has so much so many intentional spelling errors. Yeah, spell, the character gets people's names wrong all the time, and uh -huh. she kept she kept circling those. And eventually, towards the middle of the book, she would write things in the margins like, you know, I think this is probably intentional. <laughs> I just want to make sure. So. I, no, I appreciated what she did. I mean, it was actually, it was, it was, it was her job. So yeah, it is her job. Yeah. yeah. But it's, um, and, and thank goodness for copy editors. They're the yeah, ones who, who keep us from doing, making mistakes and they're good at it in my yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard job. It seems like a very hard job to me. I can't, I can't imagine being that good at it. Because I miss things all the time. I mean, I, 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 I think it's harder in your own work mm -hmm. because you're not really reading it. You're remembering it. Right. And so, like, you know, I just skip over things that are bizarrely obvious sometimes. <laughs> well, that's why I read it aloud to my husband. Because, yeah. yeah, bizarrely obvious is a good, <laughs> a good observation. Thanks. So, um, 
Is there anything that you would like to say about the book that we have skipped or missed? Nah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to market things. I don't know. I don't even like marketing things. I mean, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a weird, it's also a very weird time to be marketing things. Yeah. So, um, it makes me uncomfortable, but um, no, I, I don't, I don't have anything else to say. I, I, so did, I hope, I hope so when you finished it, did it leave you with the desire to write another one? Yes. And, and I, I, for a couple of reasons, one is that um, I, you know, like the, the experience of finishing a first book, Mm -hmm. And I had this experience when I wrote my first screenplay, finished it, is that there's, an ex there's this feeling like, okay, I can do this. Just not that it's good, just that, okay, I got through a book, you know, yeah. I wrote a novel. Um, and, and so it, it makes the next one feel like it's possible. Uh, and also, I think early on in the process, when I was, when I was starting this, I was very intimidated by writing. Sure. Um, and I had to get over that. And it took a long time, um, and but I did, and now I feel like I, I could jump into it more easily. And uh, so, yeah, so I'd like to. I'd Do you like plan to. to read the reviews? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of compelled to read things. I, I had this piece come out on me uh, yesterday in the New York Times. It was so I read that, yeah. And I. I can't read it. I mean, and I can't, and that's not a review. No. And I kind of know what's in there because I, it was an interview, but I mean, I'm, I'm so stressed about that stuff that I forced myself not to read this piece. And, um, and, but I mean, I have read the read, there've been like, you know, Publishers Weekly came out right. and Kirkus and those things, which are very short. Um, and I did read those. And so I probably will, I probably will. <laughs> um, if it if it's if it's devastating at first, I I'll stop because you know who needs it. Do you read? Well, reviews? that's the thing about book. That's the thing about novels. The reader makes of it. It belongs to the reader. It goes out from you. It's it true. Goes into a book and then it goes into the reader and it then belongs to the reader. Absolutely. And. Um, you yeah. can't do anything about it except try again if you want to. Yeah, there's a, a actually talk about that in in the in the in the, in terms of movies in in Ant Kind, the idea that it's a it's a um, a relationship between the viewer and the person who made the movie, and that it doesn't exist without the, the book or the movie doesn't exist without the person watching it, and mm -hmm. it's going to be different for everybody who, who watches or reads it. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And, um, you know, but there's also like that sort of ego thing, like you don't want to yeah. want to be mocked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's see. Do I have a last question? I don't, I, I don't want to delve too deeply into the book. Maybe you should tell us a little bit about the movie that is about to come out. Oh, um, it's called, I'm thinking of ending things. And it's an adaptation of, not my title, it's the title of a novel by um, a, a writer named Ian Reed. And, um, and it's, an, it's, it's, it's kind of an adaptation, I say kind of, because it goes a little off, um, uh, off of the book, go away from the book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about a young man and young woman, it's very small, um, in, in scope, the opposite of mankind. It's about a young man and a young woman who, who are on a road trip to visit uh, his parents at their farmhouse. She's never met his parents before. And it's during a snowstorm. And um, it's kind of like a meditation on isolation. And um, So where is the filming location? Um, we filmed it upstate New York. Oh. And um, in and around a town called Middletown. And, oh, that's one of uh, my favorite places. Up Middletown or, or? Well, the Catskills and that. Yeah, area. yeah. Do you live on the East Coast or the West Coast? I live on the West Coast, but for a long time, I, I went to college in New York, and so I loved the Catskills. And Yeah, it's beautiful up there. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And there's plenty of snow. 
there was plenty of snow, but the problem with making a movie is that it doesn't come when you need it. Um, <laughs> so there's plenty of uh, snow that we invented. Um, really? You know, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of snow that, um, that we have people on set basically shaking stuff outside of a window. <laughs> Um, but we also have a lot of, um, com you know, computer stuff that was done in, in Oh, right. Yes. Because they're driving through a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we had to supplement the actual snow. Uh, but yeah, that was the hope. The hope is that you have it. Um, but you know, your schedule is such that you have to shoot on this day. You know, like, like Quentin Tarantino, um, when he shot his movie, um, that took place. Uh, during the snowstorm, and I can't remember the name of it. Um, you know, they waited for months. They were in the Rockies. Wow. Apparently, they waited for months for snow, but we didn't have that budget. You know, like I said, we had 24 days, and if it came, yeah. it came. so um, yeah, so we we had to do it in post production. So is it easier to make movies now in the era of digitization than it used to be? It's not only easier now to do those kind of effects, but it's easier now to do those effects than it was five years ago. Oh, is that right? They're, oh. much, they're much better now. They're much more sophisticated and, and it, it, it gets increasingly so every, hmm. every year. So um, it's still a struggle. Um, and it's still, it's still a lot of work to, um, to create a snowstorm. It's, it's very complicated, um, but I, I, think they were, I think they were very, ended up being very good at it. That's so, cool. Yeah, yeah, it is cool. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. If you want to write, if you want to make a movie about a horse that escapes from Otoy into Paris, please do it. Is that a book? <laughs> That's the one I have coming out in December. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> What's it called? Per Perestroika in Paris. Oh, I like the title. Yeah, I'll read it and I'll um, okay. <laughs> movie. If you can, If you can promise me that I can get financing, then I... Um... That's up to Ted. <laughs> That's up to Ted? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Well, should we take some audience questions? Sure. Sure. All right, so uh, the first question um, is somebody asking, can you please share the differences between writing for the screen and writing a novel? Um, sure, I can, I kind of did that a little bit already, but I can maybe do it a little more. Um, the difference, well, I mean, I guess it's a question that I'm, I, I don't know if they mean the distance and the difference in terms of getting things made or, but the difference in terms of, um, I think she adds, um, you know, that in, in screenwriting, you have a relationship with a director and casting and sometimes co-writers, et cetera. Whereas in a novel, it's purely solitary. So yeah, I mean, that is, that is the experience that it's, it's more of a collaborative form when you're writing for movies. And, um, even if you are, the writer and the director, you still have other people who are realizing uh, the work. You know, you have actors and you have uh, designers and cinematographer and people like that. So, um, so there's a value in that um, uh, because if you're working with people who, who you respect, you get a lot of input and, 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 and the thing grows. Um, certainly when I did this movie, um recently and, and the other movies i've directed you know working with the actors and the, and the designers and stuff is, has 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 uh, you know ended up bringing in a lot of new ideas and exciting ideas um but yeah i mean i like the idea of writing a book in that when i'm done with the book the book is done you know i don't i don't have to then um make it <laughs> you know that the book is the thing um and so you know, you have all of that in mind when you're writing it, that this is going to be the end of it. It's going to be the thing that the, that the reader interacts with, as opposed to this other thing that happens after you finish the screenplay. Another question on your process. Um, did, you out, did you do an outline for this book? No. No, I didn't. I, I don't tend to outline things. I'm not interested in that because when I start, something, I don't know anything. Um, so to outline it um, and determine where this thing is going to go before I know what the thing is, um, seems to be kind of like, um, like corralling myself. So I like the idea that I come up with an idea and then it's sort of 
elaborate on it and then I understand something about a character and then that leads me to go this place with it and and a new character comes in and that leads it to go here you know um and then you go you know and then I will go back and adjust things that needed to be adjust that need to be adjusted now that I know this about the character or this about the circumstances but I like the uh, freedom of this thing um just sort of expanding so that that makes it interesting for me it's a form of exploration. Yeah, it, it is an exploration, I think. Act, act, exactly. That's what it is. And I, and, I, and I like that. Same person had a follow-up question for you, Jane. Uh, do you outline your books? Some are planned, some are unplanned. Um, sometimes the plan is just very simple. For example, for the last 100 years trilogy, I knew we were going to do 100 years um, one at a time and I wasn't going to skip over any of them. So I had to look up what was going on in particular years, even if nothing very eventful was going to go on. So that, I don't know if you'd call it a plan or just a strategy. For A Thousand Acres, I tried to stick with the plot of King Lear as best I could. Um, and for some books, it's like with Charlie, I'd say, okay, let's get started and see what happens. And uh, another question about the adaptation or possible adaptation of this book into a movie or a TV series. Is that something, assuming you, you made reference to funding earlier, but assuming this is doable and you, 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 there was a buyer interested, do you see, um, uh, is this something you would like to adapt and also direct? I would think about it and I would try to figure out if it's possible. I, I don't, at this point, know how to do it. There are issues. Uh, with visualizing things in this book that are left to your imagination that I, that are that are that confuse me that I think would I think would tip it in certain directions that I don't want to tip it I want the the reader to have the experience of understanding it or figuring it out um, well but, I have a suggestion okay one of the show that we watch a lot is in treatment you know with Gabriel Byrne yeah and there's uh, oh, there must be 90 or 100 and some episodes. Oh, wow. And they're all about 23 minutes long. So I think you could do 120 episodes, 23 minutes long of this book. Yeah, no, I think I, think I agree with you that it, it could be a series. And I, and I think it would have to be a series because it's too dense to be a movie. But, you know, without sort of like giving away the things I don't want to give away in the movie, I feel yeah. like I don't know how to solve certain problems sure. in terms of how it's going to be visualized. Mm -hmm. So that would, that would be the thing that would keep me from doing it. If it were to be done, I would have to be the director. I mean, that would be because I, I to answer the other part of that question, um, I wouldn't trust it to somebody else because of the issues that I am concerned about. There's a, a, another question that's sort of related to the, what you guys have just been talking about. And that is, do you see this, um, uh, flurry of uh, series on Netflix and Hulu and various other streaming service as a great new opportunity for storytelling? I mean, how do you feel about that? Uh, is this for Jane or for me? For, for you. Um, well, as somebody who, you know, has difficulty getting work, I think it's a great thing. You know, it's, a, it's an opportunity for people to work, which, which has kind of gone away a bit in the, in the, actual theatrical release movie business. So yeah, I think, it, I think it's a great thing. I, I don't have anything else to say about it I, other than, you know, peop, since 2008, everybody's been struggling to get work made. And now it's kind of like, it's, it's at a point now where people have opportunity. So it's good. Well, what it reminds me of is how when Charles Dickens was writing, he, his, first ep, his first books were always episodes in a in a magazine that would be read aloud somebody would buy the magazine and it was estimated that for every person who bought a magazine 15 people would listen to it oh wow and then that would promote the book and so there's always been this sort of back and forth between a self-contained novel and an episodic novel and i think that had to happen in the movies too people want more 
and they don't want it to be, uh, you know, to have a cohesive plot all the time. They want to just keep going. And I think that's been one of the great things about all these Netflix series and stuff like that. Um, the next question is, someone says, I understand you started this uh, novel a while ago and you've stopped and taken up uh, film projects in between. What was it like coming back to something you started and, and picking it up again? It never really goes away um, when I'm working on more than one thing at a time. I'm always, it's always sort of like gestating um, and I always feel the pressure of it. Um, so, because I know I have to finish this. And so the feeling at the time is one of pressure because now I have two things to do. I've taken on this, you know, this particular movie or TV job for money. Um, and now I, and I have to do that. And now I have to also do the, the book. Um, but I do find, and I have found when I put things away, um, and I come back to them, I often find new directions. And, and it's, this happens a lot when I get stuck, where, where I, I, just, I just don't know where to go with something and I put it away. And, I, and when I come back to it and I find, oh, I can do this, there's this real feeling of relief that I didn't push myself to finish it before I knew what to do with it, you know? Because I never would have gotten, I never would have come to this thing that I like. Um, that only came with time. And, and so I feel like there is this sort of like, I guess, as I said, this, this sort of like silent gestation that's happening even when I'm not working on something. Uh, well, that, I have a friend who's a brain, um, uh, what's the word I'm talking about? She said she analyzes how the brain functions. Right. And actually, if you're worried, 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 you're working, 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 and then you put it aside. Your brain actually has a process where it pairs away your worries. And then when you come back to it, you see it in a fresh way and you think, oh, bingo, I know how to do that. Oh, and you've had that experience as well. So many times. Yeah. yeah. So many times. It's, it, it, it's comforting to know that that happens or can happen. And then a, a final question, uh, Charlie, is someone is uh, asking about um, Susan Orlean's book, The Orchid Thief, that became the movie, The Adaptation. Um, how, at what point did, did telling that uh, as the movie, telling the story of, of adapting the book convince you was the movie to make about the book? Um, I, I was struggling with that, with that um, adaptation. Uh, for a long time. I, I would, I don't remember how long, but I would say it was months and I was very depressed um, and worried. Um, and, you know, it was very early in my film career. So I was also worried that I was going to have to sort of say, I can't do this to the producers. And that would, it would kind of tarnish my reputation. Uh, so um, I gave myself, I did an exercise where I, where I said um, to myself, what, what is it that's, really on my mind right now. And the obvious thing that was on my mind was that I didn't know how to write this thing. Um, and I thought, oh, what if I write about that? And then I started thinking about that and uh, how it kind of sort of worked with, I thought, what were the themes of the book? But I still didn't feel comfortable doing it because it was like a, they, I didn't tell the producers I was going to do this. You know, I, I just sort of, um, I, w I was worried they would say no, and it was my only idea. But I did speak to um, Spike Jones, um, and he he said he got really excited about the idea, and he said, "Oh, you've got to do this," um, which gave me confidence that it was an interesting idea. And and so I and so I did it. And when I started to work on it, and and it started to sort of fall into place, and all these pieces. Um, um, started to become exciting to me and I was able to write the script and it felt to me that that was sort of proof that it was an idea that was a value at least in my mind um, so that's how it happened thank you and uh, thank you Jane for taking part in our uh, talk uh, Thanks. Today. It was fun.
Yeah. Um, a reminder again, Charlie Kaufman's novel is Ant Kind, and it's available wherever books are sold, and signed copies are available in the link in the comments section.